So today on Screenshots, we're going to talk about one of the most important children's shows in the history of uh, CBC television. Of course, it's the ever popular and ever miss The Friendly Giant. Now, uh, The Friendly Giant uh, aired on CBC television from sep September 30th, 1958 through to March 1985. Now, it featured three main characters, uh, a giant named Friendly, played by the uh, excellent uh, presenter Bob Holm, who lived in a huge castle, along with his puppet animal friends Rusty, who was a rooster in a bag who played a harp and uh, lived by the castle window, and the giraffe Jerome. Now, the two puppets were, uh, were manipulating a voice by a Rod uh, Coney Bear, and... Uh, the entrance music and the exit music of the traditional song Easy One Morning da, 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 has been uh, probably the unofficial second Canadian anthem for many people in Canada for many, many years. Now, the show originally uh, aired would be a word, but was presented in the States from uh, 1953 to 1958 and uh, moved to Canada, of course, in 1958. Now, uh, the estimates are, and there's nothing official, but you're saying more than 3,000 individual episodes were presented. Now, there were 15-minute episodes uh, multiple times a week, and uh, uh, most of them were based on a one-page script, and a lot of the, uh, lot of the show was ad-libbed. But the origination of the show was in Madison, Wisconsin, in uh, 1953, on uh, radio station WHAAM, no confusion with the hockey league of the same name. Now, this station was owned by the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and um, uh, shortly before it started, it uh, was moved to its sister television station, WHATV. Now, uh, old kinescopes of the shows were, uh, uh, were distributed to uh, various non commercial stations, and uh, one of them uh, fell upon the desk of CBC headquarters in Toronto. And at the invitation of uh, Fred uh, Rainsbury, uh, who was head of children's television at CBC at the time, uh, the show was moved to Canada because Holm basically believed the future for it would be on a more public network like we had in Canada at the time. And it was a staple show for uh, numerous generations of young children, myself included. I remember as a child from the late 60s into the 70s and 80s and even my teen years, The Friendly Giant was a very, very... Uh, you know, a positive show. It talked about uh, emotions. It talked about friendship. It talked about, uh, uh, you know, different topics, uh, everything from history to music. And um, now, for years, the National Education Television, which was the precursor to maybe PBS, carried both the, uh, both the WHA and CBC versions uh, from 1953 and 1970, when uh, NET uh, merged with uh, PBS in 1970. Now, uh, McCarthy, uh, uh, Daniel McCarthy produced The Friendly Giant, and his success there eventually led him to become the head of children's programming at the CBC. But ladies and gentlemen, the, the show had a very specific look at it, uh, and here it is. It's probably the most famous opening and closing in Canadian children's uh, TV history. Now, each episode would begin with the camera uh, panning to left over a very, very detailed model of a village, a farm, a harbor, a city, etc. And uh, Friendly will be given a description of what they're going to go over in the episode and talk about what's going on in the town. Now, uh, the pan would continue until it uh, would stop at the Friendly Giant's boot and the camera would pan up and there was Friendly uh, telling them to come into the castle because he's going to let the drawbridge down and open the front doors. Now, the early one morning, da, 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 and it basically was a start of a presentation uh, for uh, people. But because it was on harp and recorder, the, the theme was extremely, extremely simple, but complex uh, for the people, and it drew people into an aspect of a perfect location to learn more as a young child of what were what a life would all, all about. Now, when the drawbridge would drop, everybody would go inside and uh, the giant would uh, put out miniature uh, furniture for his viewers uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the old spiel would go like this. 
Here we are inside, and here's one little chair for one of you, and a bigger chair for two more to curl up in, and for someone who likes to rock, a rocking chair in the middle. And uh, he, the giant would again call people to come up. He said, look up, way up, and I'll call Rusty, and Rusty would uh, uh, come out of the bag, Rusty the rooster. Then typically the drone giraffe would visit as well. He would, uh, you know, push his head through the high window after being whistled out of friendly. But uh, Rusty was a quieter personality than Jerome. Jerome was more outgoing. But Jerome had psychedelic uh, giraffe colors, while Rusty was your typical kind of 1950s uh, hand puppet. And uh, But uh, the, the the voice actor who did this gave both of them life. We believed there were, not say what to say, real people, but real. Now, uh... The, the bag that Rusty was living in was actually a book bag. And uh, that book bag would prevent, provide all kinds of stuff, including books and other props. And uh, most of them, it must have been a magic book bag because coming out of there, maybe were too large to uh, come in. Now, um, the banter between friendly Rusty and Jerome would go on. It'd be a gentle, you know, kind of a friendly chat between friends. And it would be followed by a story or a musical performance. And... Uh, if the song needed extra instrumentation, they would have uh, a session group, including uh, silent puppet cats and raccoons and a rooster. Uh, Angie and the fiddle, the jazz cats, and Patty and Polly, the raccoons, who had a recorder and bassoon, and uh, Buster had a rooster with, of all things, an electric bass guitar. And uh, music for the show uh, was also composed by the show's harpist, John Duncan, very talented, uh, classic uh, uh, performing. Now, at the conclusion of a, of a show, early one morning would play again. He would say goodbye, and uh, he would end with, it's late. This little chair will be waiting for you, one of you, in a rocking chair for honor who likes to rock, and a big armchair for two more to curl up in when you come again to our castle. I'll close the big front doors and pull up the drawbridge after you're gone. Goodbye. Goodbye. When the friendly would wave goodbye, the camera would zoom out, zoom out uh, about the castle and medieval doors, and a silvery moon with a smiling face would rise up to the sky, and oftentimes a cloud would jump over the moon to the rhyme, Hey Diddle Diddle, and um, sometimes a cow would appear in the sky, but sometimes it was a bird, or winking, blinking, and nod, or Pegasus, or whatever, and... Um, for some reason, because uh, the musical performance episodes, most of the episodes would take place completely at night. So this was almost like a, a, a bedtime story at 10 o'clock in the morning on CBC, which is quite bizarre. Now, when I said uh, the shows were largely ad-libbed, uh, and a one-page plot summary for me, each episode kind of detailed it, because 15 minutes goes fast in children's programming. Now, the spontaneity that the show had was kind of unique to the friendly giant and uh but it's a uh, gentle nature or like uh, the positivity it was something that everybody could sit around and learn from and absorb because you know the friendly giant wasn't a giant he was a friendly individual he was there to uh celebrate music and stories and but well, the repetition of the, the main elements, according to a lot of, uh, you know, scholars in children's uh, television, uh, was kind of a, 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 a other side of the coin, a coin to, as compared to the other part of the CBC Morning Block, which is Sesame Street. Sesame Street would have, uh, you know, more action, more music, sometimes, uh, you know, bigger issues. But The Friendly Giant was that perfect start to, uh, uh, you know, a preschooler's day or an older kid that's home from school because of sickness or whatever, you could put it on and basically you were, you believed you believed the castle was real. You believed in what the friendly giant was trying to say because, it, because again, it was extremely, extremely geared towards a specific style of children's programming that people would adore back then. And for a lot of people, and this uh, podcast goes a shout out to all my friends in Woodstock, which I mentioned I was doing a friendly giant or a possible Friendly Giant podcast, and one lady said, you, she watched it over 35 years, he said, you got to do it. He said, the Friendly Giant means so much to young mothers and young fathers at the time because they basically grew up in the show 
And if you had to put a kid in front of a TV to watch something, your friendly giant would do it. Now, this block of children's programming I talked about, uh, you had a friendly giant, then Mr. Dress Up, which is it could be a future podcast, uh, and then the Canadian version of Sesame Street, because the Sesame Street version in Canada was much different in the States because there's a bilingual nature. Now, um, but get this, ladies and gentlemen, the show in 1984 came under fire because the... Uh, the, the federal government made deep cuts into the CBC and the Friendly Giant was not carried over and it was cancelled soon afterwards. Uh, although CBC executives insisted that the show's passing was unrelated to the cuts, it was commonly thought at the time that the movie was, movie was intended to create enough public outrage that the government funding cuts to the CBC would reverse and of course they weren't. Uh, there was a strong public sentiment to keep the show in the air but the funding cuts were not reversed and no new shows were made. It aired uh, for many years later in repeats because, again, the show was timeless, uh, no pun intended. Now, uh, it was replaced by uh, the, the ever-popular Fred Penner's Place and uh, also known as The Giant Killer. Uh, but the final total of episodes is more than 3,000. I think it would be more towards 3,200 or 3,300. And I guess CBC... Uh, has uh, nearly a thousand episodes uh, of the show in archive, including the, the kinescopes of the earliest episodes. Now, uh, post the retirement, Robert Holm uh, was made a member of the Order of Canada in 98, and he died on May 2nd, uh, 2000, at the age of 81, of uh, prostate can uh, cancer. Now, there's an authorized biography of uh, uh, Robert. It's called A Look Up, Way Up, and it's based on interviews conducted with... Uh, home after retired and uh, there's various audio clips that are uh, part of the book presentation as well now the um, props costumes and puppets for the show actually uh, were on display at one point at a CBC museum in Toronto as part of the exhibit called growing up with CBC but um, the friendly giant paraphernalia was actually removed from the museum uh, after, without permission of the family, Rusty and Jerome appeared in a sketch during the 2007 Gemini Awards without permission, and uh, some believe in these families in poor taste and disrespected the memory of uh, uh, Ohm. Uh, his daughter was very, very displeased. And uh, But uh, currently, only the castle wall and window in which Friendly would uh, talk to Rusty and Jerome remained in the museum. Now, the beautiful train set at the start actually is still on display at the uh, Pump House Steam Museum in Kingston, Ontario. And uh, that's a popular uh, spot to uh, celebrate all things train in Canada. And uh, But the design of the, uh, like the papier mache of the friendly giant castle, the, uh, the uh, what do you call, the uh, quaintness of the, the puppets, the quaintness of Bob Holm, it, uh, the show is so beloved in Canada Every person I know can hum the big friendly, uh, the friendly giant theme. Uh, they get very sad because it was so much a part of who we are, but we were back then. Because, you know, Canadians, uh, we really treasure our CBC icons. Uh, you know, Hockey Night in Canada, and, you know, Mr. Dress Up and uh, uh, the Friendly Giant and all the major afternoon shows. I mean, going back to Take 30, Fifth Estate, 22 Minutes. Codco, uh, I mean, you know, the, the, this is part of all your fires. Uh, our culture in Canada, a lot of it is based on CBC or Pride culture. And if you're looking at a top 10 show in CBC history, Friendly Giant is there. I don't know where it would rank finally because it's only a 15-minute show. But uh, for a lot of people, 30 minutes would have been too long or 5 minutes would be too short. 15 minutes, no pun intended. Say, uh, say like Goldilocks is just right. And um, every time I hear that theme song, I think of a time long past in Canada. Because there was a time in this country, ladies and gentlemen, that we were as, as not say, uh, common, but we were very, very easygoing. We're more hyper now because internet has made everybody hyper. But it was a point, ladies and gentlemen, that Canada could be reflected in their TV programming in my, Hockey Night in Canada as well. And the Friendly Giant was part of that. So if you have a chance to go on YouTube, there's many, many 
friendly giant uh, partial and main episodes there the his book is still available it's uh for an american really to understand a friendly giant would be kind of difficult the only thing i, I can compare it to and this is the obvious is mr rogers but mr rogers was a little bit too heavy for canadians it was never really a great success when it aired in canada originally and went to the states but uh, the friendly giant uh if if a, a giant could be canadian and have the best aspects of canada you know uh it would be the friendly giant and uh for those who are listening to podcasts is bringing back a lot of memories uh you know it makes me teary-eyed sometimes just to uh, remember how good we were in canada for a number of years uh we're not really a good nation anymore again the hyperness maybe we'll get back to it but canada was a calm nation at one point we had our issues sure but the friendly giant was basically a canadian deep down doesn't want he wants everybody to be happy that's the difference with the states i don't think everybody in the states want anybody to be happy most canadians want everybody to be happy and that's the big distinction ladies and gentlemen i'm not saying this is a, as a racist comment but uh, americans are not canadians and they never can be because to be canadian it's a state of mind it's not just a country being canadian is a person that basically looks at everything as as a learning experience we're not obsessed with money or politics and most of us are um you know a lot of canadians are americanized but anybody that's a true friendly giant fan they're canadian through and through and uh he never he rarely had guests on the show too i don't remember any guests because i know mr dress up had guests and fred penner of course but anyway 15 minutes all you need is your raccoons and cats as your backup band and they're probably the most important canadian uh, classical band of uh, of their era because a lot of kids got into classical music or the recorder music because of the friendly joint so so again on this rainy day in the woodstock uh, canterbury region we're telling everybody to uh, of course again uh, road hockey keep your stick on uh, on the uh, on the road hockey or in the rinks that you're still playing keep your uh, stick in the ice and uh, this is a great day for Canada, of course. Our native son, Vladimir Guerrero, is on a hot streak. Toronto Blue Jays right now are still Canada's team, until otherwise. And uh, we wish everybody happy days, and as we'll sing you out. How's that sound? Da, 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 da,